Well, when I was about uh, 12 years old, I thought of myself as a, as a musician. I played the violin and the viola and I composed music. I wanted to be a classical musician. Why am I talking about music when you're talking about film? I'll tell you why. Uh, I heard that there was a film being shown uptown in Philadelphia. Uptown meant about five miles away. That uh, had original music of Prokofiev. Well, this was exciting. So a friend of mine who was a cellist and myself, we wanted to save seven and a half cents each to take the trolley car, so we walked. And we went uptown and we went to see this movie for 11 cents. It was called Alexander Nevsky, Eisenstein. Uh, I came to listen to the music and it probably was the first real film that affected me. I don't know why it affected me so much. The visuals were so powerful. The emotion was strong. It was a Russian film. It had subtitles. But it affected me. And of course, the music was absolutely elegant, as Prokofiev always has been. He was one of the greatest of the composers of the world. So I saw Alexander Nevsky and it stayed with me. When I began to study film at USC, one of the films that I studied was Alexander Nevsky because he wrote a book in which he showed many of the storyboards and how he achieved the rhythms and the visuals and it was like a, a circle being completed. I heard about Hans Hoffman in New York, that he was the great teacher now in America. He was a German from Munich who knew all the greats. He knew Picasso and Matisse. He knew all the great European painters and he had escaped the Nazis. And he was in New York City and he had an atelier there. So a friend of mine who wanted to be a painter very badly said, let's go to New York and study with Hans Hoffman because we had the money from the GI Bill. GI Bill was the greatest thing that ever happened in this country, I think. This Congress wouldn't know what the hell to do with it. And uh, we, we went to New York and we got a, uh, a, a room where <laughs> in the middle of the kitchen was a table. You lifted up the table and it was a bathtub. <laughs> you see, everything was <laughs> very compact. But that wasn't all. This was up in 115th Street or 16th. And uh, we heard all night tramping of the steps. We were on the first floor. We heard people going up and down. And there were some very nice women who lived upstairs. And then we discovered that we were living in a working whorehouse, which was wonderful. <laughs> they were so kind to us. We were young and painting all day. There it was. We were painting. And uh, then we went to Provincetown and continued painting. And the beards grew bigger and bigger. And we had to look like painters, you see. And um, one day I decided, you know, I'm never going to be Picasso. I'm never going to be Henri Lut. I'm never going to be Kiriko. I'm never going to be any of these Matisse. So why am I painting? I'll be second best. And so I quit and got some people together, three people, 
who wanted to go west. And I sent some of my photographs that I had always taken to the art center school here in Los Angeles. And they accepted me. And we drove across country. A horrendous trip, because my old Chrysler just wasn't a happy car. We were very happy, but the car wasn't. <laughs> We made fun of Jackson Pollock because he was a bit of a drunk okay. and he couldn't draw. And even though you're a painter, you start with drawing. Okay. And drawing is, is an important thing. But this was the time of abstract expressionism where you could make big blobs of yellow and orange and a big line going through it. And, it's, and if the painting is big, then it's considered good. The bigger, if you can't make him good, make him big, we said, you know. We saw his drawings and they were really primitive. He, he was very good. He was very frustrated mm -hmm. at this. And then one day he began to dribble paint on the floor on his canvases. And we saw some of them and we left. I mean, this was terrible. What's he doing? Not only that, he was using house paint. Now, house paint doesn't last on a canvas. It cracks up and all, but <clears throat> he started using house paint. And um, he'd hang them up around the walls, and, and we thought, Jesus, he's going nuts. He's drinking too much. Now I look at them, and I see what I didn't see before. I was blind to it. Mm -hmm. Because we were studying plastic space, how to create space within the canvas that does not use perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, he had found the key. He had layers, layers, and so the eye looked like it was traveling in and out. That's plastic, you see. And uh, I look at his paintings now, and each one has a color theme. He did understand color and the form well the form is what he made it but it had plasticity and it had unity of color and unity of tone and it actually had light the way he used his light colors against dark so i was wrong maybe i'm not usually wrong <laughs> Well, then they asked who wanted to go to Iran to shoot documentaries in, the, in Farsi and for the Iranian people. Well, I immediately enlisted. I was married by now. And so I said to my wife, you know, this is a real opportunity to practice. So I'm going to go for a few months and then, you know, you'll come. I'll send for you. Okay, I left and uh, started working as a still photographer. And then we got a call from the embassy and the, the uh, ambassador said, can you send a cameraman with a little film down to Abadan? That's in the south. That's where the war was going on between Iraq and Iran. And he said, uh, there's a locust plague that's coming across from Arabia. And it's eating up everything. And I want some film to show this. So I took a, my still tripod, my contacts, a Cine Special, a very fine Kodak 16 millimeter camera, 400 feet of color film. And they put me on a plane and sent me down to Abadan just when they threw out the British from the oil companies. The BP was thrown out and we were stuck. We couldn't move. There were mobs running through the streets and you heard machine guns in a distance and it was a mess. Meanwhile, the planes were brought in by plane. They would take them out of the belly of a plane and put them together and they'd fly off looking for the locusts. And I'm stuck there. We can't move. And the 